All right, we're live. Okay. I see. I see. Hello. Happy Sunday, everybody. We're talking movies again today. I'll let Al reveal the topic. Movies, movies. That's our favorite subject. Certain kind of movie. You excited, Al? I, that's yet to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> Let me share a couple places here before we start the show. Is your recorder ready to go? It's always ready. Good. Good answer. Good answer. I'll just save it on my page. Don't worry about it. I just did it. Okay. Okie dokie smokey. One thing you could do for future reference is put a subject line, you know, when you share it. Yeah. And okay. on the Nostalgic Pod Blast page to let people know what the topic is. Okie dokie smokey. Oh, One it's me. I got it. I got it. I got it. Got it. You need to turn that down. I just did. I muted it. Let's just wait a little bit for people to join. Happy Sunday. Happy weekend, everyone. Sonny is Al's dog. He's a Cocker Spaniel. There, I'll hold him up. Hey, come here. Can you hold him up? Yeah. Hey, buddy. Sonny. See, see there, him man. on camera? Hey, say something. Barking in the mic. Barking <laughs> in the mic. Gotcha. Come on, barking in the mic. Yeah. He's a good doggy. Good dog. Well, I helped in that. I, he, he, he wasn't on. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. Today, it's anti-redneck. Now, what do you mean by that? Oh, look at that. Yeah. This whole entire show is not going to be something you'd expect. And I don't want to blow the surprise. Do, 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 do. You ready, Freddy? I think so. And towards the end of the show, we got some shout outs to Giovanni, a chef here in Atlanta. A great restaurant, Backstreet Eatery Bar and Grill in Duluth, Georgia, here in the Georgia area. And, uh, and I want to give a shout out to Wizard World for something nice they did for our show and some specific people there at Wizard World. Wizard World. While we're waiting, I might as well do it now. We're not recording officially. Yeah. I'll do it officially later as my one more thing towards the end of the program. But Mike Gregorek. He's the program director and a host at Wizard World Conventions. Check them out on YouTube or Facebook. And one of the MCs, Jerry Milani, he's really good. And they have like live panels. Like they had one with the Pirates of the Caribbean cast last night. It's free. They always do it on a subject that will interest you. You may not like everything they cover. They've did, done one on Baywatch. But it's really neat to see the stars. You can interact with them. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. And they had me on to promote the Pod Blast and talk Land of the Lost. We had a watch party Wednesday night with the cast of Land of the Lost, the Sid and Marty Cross Saturday morning TV classic that was made into a movie starring Will Ferrell. You ready? Yeah, hang on. Hey, Chance. Hey, Al. What time is it? It's Pod Blast time, of course. I'm just hearing that in one channel. Aren't Same you? here. That's weird. Why don't you start over the recording? Let's you think you can figure it out real quick? Let's just see. Let's Cut see. that and let's that's, get it right. That's just weird. That is weird. All right, we'll do that. Hang on a second. 
you never know what you're going to run into, right? That's right. Let's see. All right. Happy Masters Day for those watching the Masters in Augusta, Georgia. Let's see. Uh, there we go. I think that's right. Very now. good. You never know what's going on with computers sometimes, but anyway. Did, so are we going to start over for yeah. the recorded version? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll do that. Cool. All right. <laughs> hey, Jazz, what time is it? It's pod blast time, of course. All right. Now we're going. And on today's show, I picked the topic. You it's did. A, it's a topic that a lot of people uh, may like or they may not like. But, you know, it's, uh, it's something that I've always uh, wanted to talk about. And it's a person. And uh, today You were due. Yeah. To pick the topic. We we're, we're going to talk about one of my uh, favorite movie makers and directors, Woody Allen. And applause, yeah. applause, 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 applause. You know, he's not everybody's cup of tea. You know, he's, he, but I've always liked his movies because, you know, when you, when you watch a movie made by Woody Allen, in my opinion, is you, you feel like you know the guy. You feel like that you're a part of the story. Because he, he has a way of, he's a writer, first of all, and he writes and directs all of his movies, but he, he brings you into the story. You know, it, it, it's, it's like, you feel like you're part of it. It's not like, I know you like the Marvel movies, which is fine. I like some of those too, but they're just big screen explosions and... Like Mission Impossible, cycle. James Bond. Right. But Woody Allen is a, uh, a filmmaker that, uh, it's conversation. It's just talk. And it's all real. It's it's gritty. It's real. It's, it's New real. York. Well, he makes all of his movies because he was born and raised in Brooklyn, uh, and all of his movies basically surround himself in his life in in New York, which is fine. Um, but uh, I was born in New York in White Plains, New York. For what right, it's worth, oh, right? Nobody cares about me, but a little factoid about myself: I only lived there a week of my life, and then moved yeah. to Dallas, Texas. Been in Atlanta since I was two years old. Anyway, but uh, I've always been a fan of Woody Allen, and so. Um, I, you know, he makes him usually maybe one movie a year, uh, and uh, but it's a, it's an anticipated movie. Everybody wants to. I mean, you have to be a fan of his movies to really look out for it. You know, wait for it. But uh, how many movies did he make? He's made fifty nine. What? That's a 59 lot. Fifty nine movies in his career. And we watched a James Bond movie he was in, and he was very funny in it. Casino Royale from nineteen sixty seven. I said sixty nine, but Last you week. know, yeah, but it was, it, was, it came out in sixty seven. Right, shot in sixty six, and it's a spoof of the James Bond movies. But and know, he was he played the he played like basically Doctor No. Right, right. Well, Woody Allen was born December first, nineteen thirty five. He's 84 years old in Brooklyn, New York. Um, he has some children. Now, he had partners. Oh, boy. He had Diane uh, Keaton was a partner between 1970 and 71. Mia Fowler uh, from 1980 to 1982. And um, He was with Frank Sinatra previously before Woody, right? Right. Well, mm -hmm. he, he was also with uh, Louise Lasser from 1966 to 1970. Harlene Rosen from uh, 1956 to 1962. I don't know who she is. And uh, he has some uh, children, but he's got quite a few children, actually. But he's a songwriter and director, and he appeared in a lot of his own movies, of course, in the beginning. You know what his first movie was? I don't know. I should know that. Watch Tell. New, I'd like to learn. Watch New Pussycat. In 1965. Hold it. The song by Tom Jones? Yeah, that was the title song on the credits of the movie. Watch New Pussycat. Uh, his first play, Don't Drink the Water, on Broadway the following year. And he made his directorial debut with What's Up, Tiger Lily in 1966. That was his first movie he directed. What's Up, Tiger Lily? I've never even heard of it. This is a very educational show and then for by, me. But then by 1969, he, he made, his first big hit was Take the Money and Run. Did you ever see that? No. Funny I've seen movie. a lot of his movies, but I'm not it's seeing a, those. It's a funny movie. Personal. And... Um, and of course, he did Bananas. And one of my uh, favorite movies he did was Everything You've Wanted to Know About Sex. Did you ever see that one? I did see that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I have a favorite, but continue. I don't want to interrupt you. But Just you know, ask me my favorite. You know, you know what his break, breakthrough movie really was? 
oh. in 1970, Annie Hall in 1971. 77. Uh, excuse me, 77. You're right. Because it beat I Star Wars for Best Picture. Kind of pissed off a lot of nerds it won, like me. <laughs> it, it, it won four Academy Awards. It's a good movie. Great movie. Diane Keaton's in it. Well, that yeah, she plays Annie Hall. But, you know, and Woody Allen that year did not go to the Oscars, even though he was nominated, because he's a jazz guy. He plays in a jazz club in New York, and he plays a clarinet that he learned early in life. Uh, and so he says, that's more important to me, is to be able to go and play some jazz. And so he skipped the Academy Awards and went to play. That's really anti-ego. I like that. Yeah. No, he's not. He's, he's not, an artist. He's not Hollywood. Yeah, you know. Now, early early on in his career, he was a stand up comic, and he was on Carson. Carson loved him, uh, but he was on you know Merv Griffin. He was on a uh, Ed Sullivan show. Dick Cavett. Dick Cavett. Yeah, he did several shows with Dick Cavett. I'd love to see him on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. But unfortunately, those are among the lost episodes. I think those were the lost ones. Yeah. NBC. Are... To be brief here, not to derail you. Uh, Sixty two to seventy, early seventy two. Or erased, because NBC erased the tapes. We've mentioned that on previous pod blasts. Right. And Woody Allen was on in the 1960s, this stand-up comic. And I would love to find footage of that. I'll search YouTube as you tell your Woody Allen facts and see if I can find a clip of him doing stand-up. Well, I mean, I don't know. I would like to see it. I don't think I've ever seen... Uh, uh, I, well, I have seen Woody at, somewhere, you know, clips. Of him doing stand-up, you mean? Right, right. And um, I... Uh, uh, but, you know, I, if I had to pick a favorite movie, I'll play a clip from Woody Allen, was one called Love and Death. Now, that, you know, he did not film that movie in uh, New York. He filmed it in uh, Budapest, Hungary. Oh, you didn't plug your... There you go. Got to plug your computer up. So, but uh, Woody Allen is, uh, like I said, it's not everybody's taste, but um, uh, he's... Uh, he did make a big imprint in Hollywood, though. And his movies made a lot of money. Those makes, they make a lot of money. Very critically acclaimed. Now, we'll talk about it. One movie he made that I really liked, um, I think I have a clip from it. Um, he made a movie called Manhattan and uh, with Mario Hemingway. You know, she's uh, related to Ernest Hemingway, the uh, Arthur. But anyway, uh, he made a movie with Mario Hemingway. And what happened was, he, after the finished product, he hated the movie. He just didn't like it. He didn't like his performance in it. He, for some reason, he just didn't care for it. And that's one movie he shot in Cinemascope. And one thing about Woody Allen movies, did you know all of his movies were the sound was mono? He, I did know that. He did not do. He he did not make any movies in stereo except for one. What's that? I thought you told me there was one movie that was in stereo. Well, yeah, Manhattan was a Dolby uh, movie stereo because it had a lot of music by uh, Cole Porter. But anyway, he. Um, he shot his movies mostly in mono because it's, they were just dialogue. He said there's no need to, for stuff to be in, in stereo. I did find a clip of Woody Allen from 1962 doing stand-up on the Jack Parr program, if you want to hear a little bit. Is yeah, that okay? You can play a little bit of that. Now, or do you want me to wait? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Wait for it. Thank you. And as long as you're standing up, I want you to take off your overcoat. <laughs> this is Jack Parr, the host. Yeah. The music call, huh? <laughs> December 12th, 1962. We have a good show tonight. It's really worth staying up for. I wouldn't interrupt a honeymoon for it, but I really think it's worth staying up tonight. Here, I'll fast forward to Woody. Because that's what you want to hear. Sitting down in the... Th Let's see. What about you? Here we go. I'm sorry, folks. I didn't pre screen this. On the computer. Well, I didn't pre screen this. I got a picture of Woody up on there. There we go. Uh, Jane Mansfield was on one night with uh, Josh Gabor, and they inhaled, and we ran over, and they, he didn't get on that night. And every night this kid has been on the show, he's been cut. And uh, to give you an idea, his first routine was about. Uh, Oh, about the election. You can see how long ago that was. And I'm afraid he's overtrained. But I want him on in my spot tonight. And I want you to know that not every performer gives his spot to another performer. But I want him to be bigger than I was, even if it means he will never be back. Woody Allen! All right. Um, it's true that I was booked on the show uh, around three or four weeks ago, and 
It's not my first TV appearance, but I was, um, I never joined before this ASTRA, which is an actor's union, and I had to join it to do this television program. And when you join the union, they make you join. It's compulsory, uh, a hospitalization plan. And it's a very funny plan because it's like the Columbia Record Album Club, you know? <laughs> they send me every month a list of operations, you know, and I got to pick out six for the year that I want, you know? <laughs> And they removed for me a bonus internal organ of my own choosing. And remember that club, Al? Uh, Columbia? Yeah, I do. So I'm oh, well, I've never been there, but I remember. I use my minutes up here tonight to uh, relieve myself uh, of a sense of repressed hostility against the law. I have never the had, it's true, any brushes with the law of the major law. consequence. I, uh, this doesn't count. This is insignificant. I was once sitting home in my house, and some cars pulled up around the house, and they shined in searchlights. And I heard a voice over a loudspeaker say, we have your house surrounded. This is the New York Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted me like to throw out a tale of two cities, you know, and come out with my hands. It was a very bad situation at the time, a lot of smoke and everything. And I was unhappy about it. Now, recently, fairly recently, I moved uptown to Madison Avenue and 77th Street. And it's a good neighborhood. It's a very nice neighborhood. And it's a fun place to live. I, uh, on my corner when I first moved in, this is just one funny story, uh, I have a drugstore, and a woman ran in. She was absolutely beside herself. Her husband had reached for the wrong bottle on the medicine cabinet and had taken poison by mistake. That's a funny Ooh. story. He was home uh, on the floor, like kicking, you know, and turning blue and everything. And it was a real emergency. She needed an antidote desperately, and it was a very tough situation. And it turns out mm. the druggist was Alan Funt. <laughs> <laughs> Candid camera. Camera, camera, yeah. He'd have a hidden camera to yeah. film people. Just a little bit more of this, and then I'll yeah, you get back. He had her on in the store for a half hour there, you know, with things going. So it's a good place, and it's happy, and very convivial and everything. But because there's a lot of money up there, and it's an opulent-type neighborhood, they keep on robbing us all the time. This is a big house. <laughs> My apartment alone was robbed about four times in two years. And they kept breaking in and taking things, you know, and I didn't know what to do about it. So finally I put on my door a little blue and white sticker that said, We sticker. Gave. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I like that, We Gave. The we man gave. in my building, a Mr. Russo, a very nice man, was held up in the lobby. Two big guys held him up late at night, you know, with a bottle and a stick and everything. And they wanted all this cash, you know, and Russo, like a jerk, tried to sign for it, I think, for tax reasons or something. And they hit him a tremendous shot across the frontal lobe, you know, and he fell to the floor in the lobby in a, in a funny little crumpled heap. And he's never really been the same since the blow to the head, you know. He, he smiles a lot now, and, and he, he laughs out of context, you know, and he, he just sits on the edge of his bed and recounts his life, but not in sequence, you know. Uh, he knows to say his name if you ask him, but he's not <laughs> as perceptive as, say, the average tree stump, and he formally he was a, a lucid type, you know, he would react to a pin trick at least. He was a, 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 now it's mostly finger painting and connecting the dots and everything, you know, and it's that kind of life for him. And people said to me, Woody, like you're slight of stature, you know, why don't you build yourself up in the event there's like a hostile version from the outside world, you could come on, you know. And I went to Vic Tanny's for about eight weeks. I did, and I lifted, and I bent, and I squatted, and I did everything they wanted, and nothing happened to me at all, you know. And I finally got the at idea, all. maybe I should just give Vic Tanny the cash and ask him to walk me home nights, you know? He's almost done here with his set. Now, there's, there's a kid in my building. He was a great stand-up comic. Mm -hmm. He was really good. This is true. There's a kid in my building, a little uh, cretinous type named Leon, who takes karate lessons all the time, you know? And Leon's always walking around with his hand cocked at a right angle like this, you know? <laughs> He's a difficult kid to reason with on any level, you know? And they said that I should take judo because it's a great equalizer and everything. And, judo. You know, but I'm essentially... He's a little guy like you. And oh. I've boiled judo down to the principle that the bigger your opponent is, the bigger the beating he's going to give you, you know? <laughs> that seems right to me, you know? So I wanted to get rid of it, and that was the end. But my friends told me in the back of Esquire magazine, you can send away for a fountain pen that shoots tear gas, you know? And it's a, a real pen, and it secretes like a gaseous billow, you know? And it could disorient the dog or something. It's a good pen to have. And I sent away, it came seven and a half dollars in a plain brown wrapper, you know, and for the... <laughs> plain brown shame, wrapper. I put my cartridges in one night and clipped it into my breast pocket, and I went out on the town. So friends of town were having a surprise autopsy or something. I was invited. <laughs> and, and I'm going out for the evening, and I'm coming home by myself at 2 a.m. in the morning, and standing in my lobby 
is a Neanderthal man, you know, with the <laughs> eyebrow ridges, the long arms and everything, you know. He had just learned to walk erect that morning, you know. <laughs> he came right to my house in search of the secret of fire. He was he, he boiled life down to the principle, son good, you know, he knew that, but beyond, like, he, he was a tree swinger in the lobby. There, just you know, another uh, 30 seconds. Me, yeah. And I quickly pulled off my wristwatch and dangled. Oh, he's great. They I are like modified, him. I hear, by shiny objects sometimes. The tick-tock sound is very soothing to him, you know, but tick-tock, he ate it. Tick-tock, tick-tock. And I was really impressed with it. And I stepped back, you know, and I pulled out the fountain pen. I unscrewed the tear gas pot and pressed the trigger, and some ink trickled on my shirt. And I made a mental note to call Esquire and tell them, you know, because I'm standing in the lobby at 2 a.m. with obviously the product of a broken home, you know. I had a fountain pen in my hand. I tried writing on him with it a little bit, you know, but it was something witty, I felt. And he came at me and started to tap dance on my windpipe. And very quickly, I'm alert, I lapsed into the old Navajo Indian trick of screaming and begging. And he backed me off to the wall, and he started to remove my wisdom teeth, you know. And it was really pressure for me, and I'm trying to reason with him because I'm civilized, you know. And I tell him he's the product of an economic squeeze, you know. And he's hitting, we have steps in my lobby in case someone wants to hit your head on something. It's there, you know. And he's pounding it, and I offered to send it to camp if he wanted, you know, anything. And finally, the police came in at the last minute, and they looked around, and they took his side, which I felt was, you know, an extreme poor taste for that thing. Now, That was my second brush. My third and final was the short one, the absolute worst. Across the street from me is Central Park. And he writes his own stuff. Central Park is really populated by difficult types, you know, with zippers and sideburns and everything and black jackets. And they go through the park dismantling social workers and things, you know. And they were doing, Central Park does an outdoor production of Hamlet all the time, you know. It's a big thing. They do Shakespeare under those stars. And they were doing a great Hamlet one evening. And in the middle of the production, these six guys come walking through the park, you know, with the jackets and the boots and the whole thing. And they came upon the production of Hamlet, and they grabbed Polonius. And they held his head under the duck pond, you know, that was immediate. And they got Gildenstern (laughs) and Rosencrantz, and they broke their glasses right off the bat. They're the first. And the guy who was Hamlet, you know, felt obligated to do something because he was the lead in the production. But it's funny, you can't come on too strong with them when you're wearing leotards. You know, it doesn't... uh, Harkin Prithy doesn't cut any ice with these thumpers. Anyhow, the upshot of the whole story was they grabbed Ophelia, but fortunately she turned out to be a cop, so it worked out all right. <laughs> Anyhow, now I have to go because I have, but I have a message in my work if you are listening closely, and that is you should love your neighbor and lay off fatty foods. Good night. Well, that is true. There lay off go. those fatty foods. Did you know that Woody Allen is not his real name? Yes, I did know that. Tell us what his real name is. His, his uh, birth name is Alan Stewart Conings, uh, Conningsburg. And uh, his mother called him Alan. And so, uh, but you, do you know how he got the name Woody? Tell us, Al. He didn't pick the name Woody. He, well, he did, but how he got the name. This is kind of interesting. I didn't know this until I read it. He had a, na- a neighbor in his apartment building uh, called Nancy Krishman. And she had a dog named Woody. And Woody had a crush on her, but she didn't care for him, you know. But he liked her dog's name, Woody. So he took that name, Woody, from uh, his neighbor's dog. That's kind of spooky, isn't it? Well, it is. But it yeah, is he took, that's how he got the name Woody. Is, uh, his neighbor had a dog named Woody, and that's the rest is, you know, history. But I, yeah, I like and now, that. you know, the rest, the rest of, the story. of the story. Do you remember, I mean... I know you've watched Woody Allen movies. Do you remember the first one you ever saw? Yes, yeah, Sleepers. That was a good one, too. I love Sleepers. You know, it's funny. I have a lot of his movies, but that's one I don't have. I'll have to I'll find look for out. the trailer real quick of that. I'll have to uh, look for it. But the movie that, you know, I liked a lot was um, Love and Death. I watched that the other night. And so um, I've got a little clip here okay. of Woody talking about... Uh, uh, the movie Love and Death. Let's just see what he has to say here. Oh, good. Read Moby Dick. Has this wish been fulfilled? Yes, I read Moby Dick uh, while I was making the movie Love and Death. Uh, I, I filmed in Budapest, and uh, when I came back from work each night, there was absolutely nothing to do in Budapest. Uh, at the time when I was there, it was a drab city, and the Russian army occupied it. So I would come back to my hotel, and read Moby Dick, and uh, and I finished it, started and finished it, while I was shooting Love and Death in Budapest, and and liked it very very much. But uh, I never would have thought I would have loved 
anything at all that remotely revolved around whaling. <laughs> this is from Rohit Sang in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that you are more of a musician than a singer, but when you are in the shower or in the car alone or doing karaoke, what one song do you like to just belt out? I can sing in the shower, and my repertoire is limitless. Uh, I mean, I can sing anything in the shower, uh, and I, you know, I sing all the jazz and pop tunes, all the Cole Porter tunes, I, and my rendition of Easy to Love by Cole Porter is probably as good as one could hear in the shower. <laughs> Outside of the shower, uh, I start to have some problems with reality. Speaking as a young neurotic person, has being neurotic in life done more good or more harm in your experience? Well, it's interesting. People tend to think <clears throat> that I'm neurotic, and this, I feel, is a testimony to my acting ability. Uh, over the years, I've played the neurotic, and I've played it so well, I think. It's, uh, I'm not a good actor, but that I can do. And I played that one little thing that I can do well, that is a neurotic character, <clears throat> so effectively that people tend to think I'm neurotic in my life. When in fact, the truth of the matter is, if you looked at my entire life, you'd find that I, I'm not really very neurotic. I'm very structured, normal. I have a wife now of 10 years. I have two kids that I devoted to. I have been very productive my whole life. I don't sit around brooding and contemplating suicide or getting high or, or dissipating myself. I've been a very disciplined worker. I have my jazz orchestra that I requires practice and discipline and I play with. I have my writing and I've been able to do all these things um, on an ongoing basis for years, and, and a neurotic personality would have trouble with that. So I think that, that, uh, that I'm, I'm not neurotic, that I'm very middle-class, uh, blue-collar, beer-drinking, television, T-shirt jerk at home, uh, not someone who's ensconced in... Uh, uh, Kierkegaard or Spinoza, and, but my image is quite different because of what I've played. Do you agree with Picasso's quote, good artists copy, but great artists steal? And if so, who have you stolen from? Oh, I've stolen from uh, the best. I mean, I've stolen from, from Bergman, I've stolen from Groucho, I've stolen from Chaplin, I've stolen from Keaton, from, uh, from Martha Graham, from Fellini, I mean, I, I'm a shameless uh, thief. <laughs> I like that, shameless thief. <laughs> but th that's true. He, uh, if you watch his movies, that's true. He did He get it, ideas from other great directors. I guess everybody that makes movies or television shows, they, they do get ideas from other people. You know, people copy this show, as you know. You yeah, know, they do sometimes. You know, they, get I they get ideas. But don't you have a trailer for... Um, Love and Death? I do. I pulled it up. Here we go right now. Great movie. How I got into this predicament, I'll never know. Absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. I, Boris Dmitrovich Grushenko, about to be executed <laughs> a name. for a crime I never committed. It seems like only yesterday that I was a child, surrounded by my loving family. Uncle Nikolai with his great laugh. <laughs> Grushenko, my father, a simple man who owned a small piece of land. I remember having strange and vivid dreams. I grew to manhood and fell in love with cousin Sonia. To me, she was the perfect woman. I guess you could say I'm half saint, half whore. Just hoping I get the half that he. <laughs> Then came the war. Napoleon has invaded Austria. Fellas, I'm a pacifist. I don't believe in war. Boris, you can't be serious. You're talking about Mother Russia. She's not my mother. My mother's Russia. standing right here, and she's not going to let her youngest baby get shrapnel in his gum. I recall the rigors of military training. You're the worst soldier I ever seen. The horrors of the battlefield.
get your rant it's on. It's during the Revolutionary like War. Yeah. Hard affair with the Countess Alexandrovna, the most exciting woman in all of St. Petersburg. You're sunny. You're the greatest lover I've ever had. I practice a lot when I'm alone. Shall we say pistols at dawn? Well, we can say it. I don't know what it means, but we can say it. That's actor Michael Harold Gould in that scene. With the yeah. evil Ivan. One of my favorite character actors. And above all, my conquest of Sonia. Our marriage was the happiest time of my life until she conceived the plan that was to be my downfall. Let's assassinate Napoleon. I tried to reason with her, but it was no use. You find me attractive as a man? Yes, I think that's your best bet. The rest is history. And William. that's Diane Keaton. Yes. You know, you Diane mentioned Keaton. that. Love oh. and death. If I'd shut up, the announcer would have told you. But that movie, uh, it's funny at the end. I'll, I'll give it away, but, you know, he gets killed, you know, at the end. And then uh, he, he's standing outside the window of Annie Hall's house, and he's, he's, he's hot calling her. And Dr. And, and Death is behind him in the, you know, the robe and everything. And she goes, Boris, what happened? He says, I got screwed. Because <laughs> he, he got shot. You know? Yeah, his humor's not for everyone, but he's pretty clever. You he's, know? Well, he's a very good writer. I mean, he's, uh, but he, you know, he, after he, you know, his first movie he directed, he says, all of my movies now, if I'm in them, I'm going to direct them. Because he, you know, he just, he had a special way of how he wanted to do things. And he used, like a lot of directors do, he used his actors, the same ones, and throughout the, his career, basically. Alan Alda was in... Uh, crimes and misdemeanors from Mash, of course, and from Mash, uh, and so uh, but, on television. Yeah, but, not the movie. Uh, you know, he used and he used the same DP, the director for uh, photography, Gordon Willis, on all of his movies. You know, which is kind of he used the same cinematography. You know, it's just it's you know it, it, he's loyal. Yes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That was his mentality and, he, and his and, motto. And what I liked about his credits on his movies, like when it opens up, he just used it. They're typewritten. There's nothing fancy, you know. They're yeah. just. And did you know, uh, he writes all of his scripts on the same typewriter. He started out as a young stand-up comic. He uses the same typewriter to this day. To this day, he does not use a computer with a ribbon. Yes, with he ink type, ribbon. He types on the same typewriter. He still has it. That he, he he does all his scripts on his uh, his typewriter. But he's not erotic or anything. <laughs> no, he said, you know, he says he's not, but I think yeah. he isn't some. But, you know, he, um, but he, he, he writes all of his scripts on his typewriter. He doesn't have a computer. Or he might have a computer, but he doesn't. He just says it's, it's the way it, he does it, you know. Interesting. He Interesting. It. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean. I, talk I, about throwback. Yeah. Hey, um, did you know that he actually guest hosted? He was a guest host of The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson? Johnny Carson actually liked him a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he, he was very talented. If you, know, you don't mind, I have a clip of his just his monologue of him hosting The Tonight Show in 71. And this is from a kinescope, which is a film print of a, of a monitor. Yeah, yeah, of a monitor, yeah. Ready? Yeah, go ahead. And here, here comes the NBC Peacock. Let's see here. The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. I love that. Yeah, a, yep. tonight is Woody Allen. This is Ed McMahon along with Doc Severinsen and the NBC Orchestra inviting you to join Woody and his guests, Bob Hope, Bob James Hope, Coco, Dr. Irwin Stillman, James Coco, Hart, and Chief Red Fox. Red Fox. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Woody Allen. I'd love to see that whole show. I'll send it to you. Is the whole thing on YouTube? Yeah. In color. Ooh, I'll have to check that out. He looks so short sitting at Johnny's desk like me, like you said earlier. Mm -hmm. he's not a How big tall guy. is he? 5'2"? Five 5'3"? Five I'll look it up. You know, I'm not sure. Listen. How are you, my pal? Welcome back. Thank you very much. You have not, you've been neglecting us. I thought you'd given us up. No. It's up for uh, the movie world. You just kind of disappeared from view. We haven't seen you. When was the last time you were here? 
Uh, well, I have, this week has been, I've done a lot of television, but prior to this week I was off. The last thing that I did on television was my own special. I'm not counting Hot Dog, which is a, a children's show that, that was on Saturday morning. Oh, yes. Ah, yeah. kids out there. You saw <laughs> uh, But the last thing that I did actually was my special, which was now, um, it was about a year and a half ago, it was me, uh, Candy Bergen, The Fifth Dimension, and Billy Graham. We Fifth did a Dimension? show one evening. It was Give a me that volatile uh, <laughs> combination there. <laughs> and Billy Graham. Candy Bergen. Um, That's myself, Candace Bergen. Uh, the Fifth Dimension, and Billy Graham. And we, that was the last uh, substantial thing that I did on television. That was Sometime, about somehow, I don't know, I didn't, did nothing to see your special, sadly, but oh, somehow <laughs> I... Okay. Was nothing. I guess. I, I, I'm doing something. I just don't see you and Billy Graham together for some reason or other. Yes, it was. Oh, it's that it's same, same kid one. again. Yeah. Thought, yeah. It was good chemistry though, uh, because Graham, as you know, or for instance, I, as you know, I'm an avowed atheist bordering on agnosticism with a strong streak of cowardice in me, religiously. <laughs> and Graham uh, is a religious man. I hope this doesn't come as a shock to you. No, I heard that. Yes. <laughs> yes, he's a tall, blonde, religious man. Religious man attractive and interesting I must say when I first met him I'd never met him until that show and uh, and I found him very persuasive and after the show I I went out and bought a prayer shawl now that defies believability At, only because it's not true um, <laughs> but enough about me this is no time to be wool gathering uh, well, <laughs> What's interesting, Al, is he went right to the desk. Would he? He didn't stand up and do a monologue. Well, I want to know. First, I've been hearing some uh, wild promos about your movie, a movie called Bananas. Is that right? Yes. Is that from Going Bananas? Kind of going crazy? Is that the idea? Uh, no. Strangely enough, that's, that's from the Old Testament. Uh, the Old uh, Testament? Yes, yes. And ye shall go into the promised land, and ye shall take with thee a banana. <laughs> I don't remember. I must have missed that page. I, no. I was reading out in the wind, I think, and the, that page turned fast. That's in the Book of Numbers. The, the Book Old of Testament, Numbers. Yes. <laughs> After the Book of Letters in the Old Testament. <laughs> What, what, what does it mean in your interpretation as far as the book is, some of the movie is concerned? The movie is, a, it's just a comedy. It's just a, uh, it's over at the Cornet Theater, and it's a comedy. It's, a, it's um, you know, I was a big fan of the old-time comedy, um, Marx Brothers and W.C. Fields and that type of thing. And um, it's just my attempt at that kind of a picture, a kind of broad, uh, laugh picture. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been working on it now for about a year, or a year and a half. He and dresses up be, as Castro. You know, anyone could go see this. Oh, boy. Anyone? <clears throat> Uh, it's, yes, it's a GP-rated picture. GP. General public. Yes. Uh, that's a good question. GP not only means, uh, general audiences, but with parental guidance. Yes. Is that what you PG mean by your... PG of today. Yes, it, it can be seen by, yeah. uh, Or even PG-13. Or, uh, children, or parents with children, or parents of children, uh, parents without children, um, <laughs> or any kind of parent, or any kind of, uh, horny child can see that. Oh! Oh, oh. oh! It's actually a family picture. You know, that's the truth. If you come from a broken home, it's a family picture. It's a sweet film. It really is. And kids can go see it. You know, Take the Money and Run, which was um, uh, my first picture. Don't feel obliged to burst into uh, limitless applause. Um, <laughs> was the first yeah, Bananas was the second it wasn't movie. the first picture I did. The <laughs> first picture I did in my life was What's New Pussycat, which was... As you um, mentioned, Al. Which was, I wrote, but didn't direct. But Take the Money, I uh, directed. And uh, that got an R rating, I believe, at the time. We had a, an, R. an R or an M rating. They had a different rating system at the time. For and mature. we had a fight to get an M rating for it. They wanted to give it an R rating. And it was really, if you saw the picture, it was really a picture that you could bring kids to uh, with impunity. And... Um, where? What, what? There was not a single moment of sex or nudity or obscenity <laughs> in that film, or my private life, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> and in this picture, it's also, it's a clean picture, and, and, you know, we got a GP rating. We had to beg for it, but we got one. Mm -hmm. Now, how about your uh, play, uh, Play It Against Them? Are they going to do that into a movie? Uh, I don't know. That was that was purchased a long time ago by uh, 20th Century Fox, I believe. And I never now owned by Disney. It was, yeah. uh, play It Against Them was purchased before... It opened on Broadway, and uh, I don't know, you is know. It, is it likely that you would play, sometimes the lead on Broadway does not play the lead in Hollywood? I have a feeling it's going to go that route. Um, Who do you see in your great role? Great movie. And play it against Sam? Yes. The role that I created yes. on stage? Oh, get ready for this. 
Um, let me think. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think there are a lot of people that could play me easily. Uh, Mahalia Jackson would be one. <laughs> Mahalia Jackson. Gospel singer. Um, see, I don't know. I, you know, I wrote the thing for me, uh, and uh, they, they have had trouble casting. We had trouble getting a replacement for me on Broadway at the time. What have you been doing? Why? why? I've been away. I was down in uh, Mobile, I have to say it right, Mobile, Alabama, for the Junior Miss Pageant last evening. All right. I had a great time. I'm, I think I'm over, I'm over entertained. Did you ever get that way? Me, no. So many parties, seven out, you know, they're great hospitality down there. They're great people. And they just turned the town over to me. They said, the town is yours. Yeah. And being a gregarious guy, I took it. <laughs> right. And what is the Miss... The, the junior Miss. Junior Miss. The Junior uh, Miss. High school session. seniors from all over the country. Fifty young ladies compete for this title. Mm -hmm. And they win a <laughs> lot of prizes if they win. The girl won a $10,000 scholarship. And they usually pick a very, very sweet, very bright girl. And she represents the youth of America. And they were... Uh, they're quite good. I, I think we got very good ratings. I heard the numbers today. We got incredible ratings last night. And the girls uh, are quite charming. They're really, they floor you at 17 and 18. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a... How much they know and how clever they are and how they handle themselves. So that's a good course. age, 17 Lovely and 18. Oh, I enjoyed girls. it then and I'm even enjoying it now. Yes. yes. Uh, well, I just have to break for it's... one second. You'll understand this because you're of here course, every, night. every night. We uh, this. There's no sense in coming around. That's the whole that's thing. That's what it's all about. We'll return in just one moment right after this word of interest. You want to hear the ad? No, it's This okay. has commercials in it. Let's just hear the little bit of the first ad. Oh, okay. We, hey, listen, listen, listen. Passing by, catching everyone's eye. What is it? Listen. Dubonnet, the drink for little old ladies who are this little and just about this old. Old enough to share your taste for something unexpected and to understand why we put the cat on the label. Hello, Tyler. Little old lady of mine. All right. There you go. All right, so there's Woody well, uh, well, hosting the Tonight was his, Show. was his second movie uh, after um, Take the Money and Run. But, you mm -hmm. know, it's funny. Play It Again, Sam. You know, he's, um, he's a film buff in Play It Again, Sam. And if, 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 have you ever seen the movie? No. No. Well, no. Uh, it's... Must he, be honest. You would him. like it because he has a projector in his apartment. He's got all these films, and his whole apartment is decorated in movie posters. Oh, that's cool. You know, and he's just a big film buff, and he loves Humphrey Bogart, and he's got pictures of Humphrey Bogart, you know, playing again, Sam. Uh, and so it's a, it's a wonderful movie. But he mentioned 20th Century Fox had the rights to it. Well, you know, Woody Allen, you know, he his movies were released through United Artists in the early days. And so, uh, but if you buy the home video, Paramount Pictures owns the home video rights. Okay. That's, so that's, you see a Paramount logo. That's just that's <clears throat> just one movie that he doesn't retain the rights to because Fox bought the rights to it. But for some reason, uh, it's out of print now. But Paramount distributed it uh, for home video. That's cool. Just, just, that's just kind of strange. We've got some Facebook comments. Uh, Brian yeah. Barnwell says, "Like them all, a warm blanket for me is Midnight in Paris." Yeah, that's a good one too. You want to speak to it? I have some other Facebook comments while I'm pulling pulling them up. Why don't you talk well, you about know, that movie? I, I can't talk about that movie too much because it's been a long time since I watched it. Uh, but we'll, what we'll do, um, one of everybody's favorite movies is Annie Hall. Uh, that came out in um, 1970. Let's see here. Annie Hall was in 1977. Seven. We talked about that. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, but I've got a clip here of Woody uh, on Annie Hall. Let's just take a Woody, quick listen. Woody, you're a guy who wears many hats, writer, director, uh, producer, actor. Um, which uh, of these hats do you feel most comfortable with? Uh, I, I like to write the best because mm -hmm. I can do that without leaving my bedroom. I can get up in the morning and roll over, grab a pad and pencil, and write. And so, of course, that's the easiest. That's right. He, he writes you, in bed. When you write and uh, direct and act as you do in, in Annie Hall, does that make it easier or is that more difficult? No, it makes it easier. People think that it makes it tougher, but actually it's much easier. You know, to have one person in charge of a lot of stuff, you know, simplifies it all instead of having six people in charge. So it makes it, you know, it's much easier. Mm -hmm. You said in the news conference this morning that you felt that your films have uh, limited appeal. If you feel that way, then, then why do you continue to make them? Certainly there are so many outlets for your talents. Well, you know, uh, first of all, limited appeal for a film is still more than a book or something else. I mean, I, I, I feel that I, I do have a certain appeal, but I do think it's, it's a, you know, it's, I have a smaller following. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I think um, that uh, I have a nice loyal following that sees all my films, but 
it's not enormous. I mean, I've never had a picture that's, you know, anything close to, I don't know what to say, the sting or, or the, those kind of pictures. You know, I have a nice sort of steady following that supports me. And it's fine. I mean, I don't, yeah. I, I just assume have a limited appeal because mm -hmm. that way I feel I can continue to try and do good work and not have to worry about the problem of, of uh, changing my work to include everybody. Mm -hmm. And you also said that you didn't uh, really feel that it helps to uh, to promote or publicize the movies. May I disagree? <laughs> oh, sure, because sure, everybody okay. does disagree with me about that. But see, well, for example, this, you know, when, mm -hmm. when my viewers see us talking and then they, they feel like they know you then, they really know you, and I think then that sells Woody Allen and they'd go to see any of your films. Well, that would be wonderful. I always feel that for me to be on a TV show, for instance, and say, well, Annie Hall is a wonderful movie or I've tried to do this in the movie or something, is one thing. And maybe a couple of people would go like that, but really what has to happen is the movie has to open and a group of people have to go see it, and then they must love it and tell their friends, you gotta go see this movie. Yeah, that's right. That's really the best way. Mm -hmm. You know, I always, I'm a firm believer in people enjoying a movie and telling their friends to see it as, as the, the healthiest way for other people to go and see it. Mm -hmm. But I, I still think, you know, when they see you, and uh, on a, in a casual situation like this, a very informal thing, and then they get to know you, Woody Allen, and then That'd they're sold great. on you, see? And they'd, uh, they'd, they'd go great. to anything you're in. Unless they take an instant disliking to me. That's the other possibility. Oh, but uh, they're not going to do that. They no. couldn't do that. Well, you can never tell. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you feel that uh, TV is soul-degrading for you? Well, uh, I, I don't feel that. Uh, I feel it's soul-deadening for the country because I feel the entertainment shows. Now, again, not the talk shows or news or that kind of thing, sports, but the stuff that's offered to you as entertainment on television. Mm -hmm. You know, the movies that you see on TV, they take the best movies and they, they edit them for television. They cut them up. They put commercials all throughout them. And they put on these situation comedy shows and give you canned laughter on them. And the shows are, you know, inoffensive factory made sort of shows and um, the police shows and the, all the stuff that's on I think is just you know it's just so there's so much bad stuff on and it's on day in and day out year in and year out and it's too bad because the medium itself could be wonderful if the people that were doing stuff in it would uh, would always take it for granted that the audience watching is real intelligent mm -hmm. and real high class and give them good stuff instead of always thinking, well, the people out there are not going to get it or they'll be offended by it or they won't understand it. The American public is a lot smarter than the people who run television give them credit for, mm -hmm. I feel. Yeah. Okay, we're back. I think we have a call. Let's see who Hello, Bob Blast, who is this? Hey, it's Mark. Hey, Mark, I saw your thing on Facebook. You said, uh... Right. Sup, ninjas. Sup, <laughs> sup, ninjas. What's up, ninjas? Right. What's up, ninjas? Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but good, nice to hear from you. How you doing? I've been all right. Yeah, I've had to watch y'all stuff afterwards because I sleep through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you watching. Thank you. Are, are, you, are you working the all-night shift or something sometime? No, nah, it's just I tend to be up a little late on Saturday, so sometimes. Well, yeah. Well, let me, let me football, ask you something. Uh, we're talking about, of course, Woody Allen. Do you, I mean, right. do you like his movies? Have you been a fan of his movies? Well, I'll start it off with, um, I was exposed to the, uh, it was a double album, Woody Allen stand-up comic. Right, right. It's him doing stand-up. It was funny. Some of the funny, oh, yes. Oh yes, and it was sillier stuff, and I, I prefer the, the Woody Allen, the sillier stuff like take the money and run. Right, it's hilarious right. To me, uh, bananas, uh, sleeper. You know, my I, favorite. Well, yeah, he, he 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 made funny funny movies, but he wanted to make serious movies, and I'll talk about. He made a movie called Interiors. It's it's really it's it's with Diane Keaton and some really good people, but he's he, he wrote it, but it's a very very depressing movie. Did you ever see it? Interiors. Yes, I, yeah, I've I've seen most of his stuff. You know, it's like I say, I prefer the his earlier stuff. It's it's less less heady. It's certainly you know more slapsticky. Right. I like I prefer his funny stuff actually over. 
I mean, I like the serious stuff too. Like I watched a movie this morning uh, before I went to uh, mass. It was I watched uh, uh, Murder in Manhattan. Uh, with, yeah. with Alan Alda, and you know Diane Keaton was just this boring housewife. She was married to Woody Allen, and of course they met their neighbor one night, and they went in for coffee and stuff. And then the guy's wife just all of a sudden had a heart attack, and so as it turns out, you know Diane Keaton thinks that he murdered her, and he didn't believe it. And it, it's really involved, and it's just it's it's really funny. It's just uh, well, it's not it's funny from the dialogue, but it's a serious subject. But it's, it's a great movie, Murder, Murder in Manhattan. And Alan Alda played um, an attorney-type guy that uh, was friends with uh, Diane Keaton. And they were, see, and then Woody Allen says, you're crazy, you're crazy. He didn't kill his wife. You're going to get us. You know, he was just like, he was very neurotic. He was just like, he couldn't believe it. And I won't tell you how the, if you haven't seen it, how the movie ends, but it's, a, it's a funny. It's, it's good. It's a good movie, Murder in Manhattan. So yeah, I, I've, I, I've, seen, I've seen it, and, and I, I like you know, a lot of people, you know, Zelig, I thought was good. Thought well, Zelig, right. you know, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I liked it too. You know, it was really good. And you have a bunch of movie posters here, Al, for Woody Allen movies that you, you'll you show throughout the show that you took photos of? Yeah, I got them there on the, you know. One, can you step in there and get those DVDs just so I can show off? Sure. They're on, they're on the table in there. But no, do you have a favorite Woody Allen movie? I'm going to have to. Uh, it's either Annie Hall or Take the Money and Run. Just. You know, Take the Money and Run is a great movie. It's uh, 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 it's his first directorial debut, and it's just... I had a 16-millimeter print back in the day, and all that movie. And, uh, but that's one that I don't have now. I have a bunch of his movies. so uh, I remember buying it on uh, RCA video disc. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you know, I watched Murder in Manhattan on Laserdisc. I have a bunch of his movies on Laserdisc as well. Laserdisc? What's that? I know. Well, you know, right. like like uh, there's Love and Death. I have that on uh, DVD, which I like. And we were talking about interiors, and this is interiors here. Ah, uh, would you mind showing the front and back, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Interiors. There, and uh, and you mentioned Zelig. There we go. I have that one. And. Uh, all these are available on Amazon, folks. That's right. And one that I haven't watched, uh, if I, it, I, I've watched it, but it's been or a long even. time, is a Hollywood ending where he, play, he plays a, uh, a washed-up movie director and he's trying to make a comeback. I've got that one, too. But what, you yeah, know, I've that. That's a good one, too. But what I like about Woody Allen, like I told Chance earlier, he kind of pulls you into the story. And, you know, I feel like that I know Woody Allen. I don't know him. I've never met him, but I feel like I know the guy. You ever feel that way about somebody in a movie? You you don't really know them. Well, you probably relate to him. He's kind of an everyman. Well, and he's not he's not an athlete. He's not a jock. No, no, he's not. He's just kind of a kind of. A, let's face it, he's kind of a nerd. He's kind of a scrawny, nerdy little guy. Well, he was a nerdy kid growing up, you know. But uh, he was a very smart kid too. A New Yorker. Yeah, you know. And all of his movies, he's never lived anywhere else. Now he's gone to Hollywood, I guess, and made movies. But he's always centered his life in New York. He's born in Brooklyn, and so he just. Everything is about New York, which is, is it, okay. Did he know? shoot most of his movies in New York? Yes. He must have gone to Hollywood to shoot some movies. Oh, yeah, he did. Well, other well, locations. Like for Love and Death, he went to uh, Budapest yeah. and filmed that. In, in I knew that, yeah. So, but, you know, yeah, but mo mainly in New York. That's just, but he's just... That's his stomping grounds. Did you ever see Manhattan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's... A that's a great movie. You know, the thing about it is, Woody Allen, like I told Chance earlier, he said that, you know, he hated the movie, and I don't know why. And Mario Hemingway, who was in it, she played the love interest of Woody Allen. She was only 17. Woody Allen was 42 in the movie. But they had a relationship, but they didn't have sex. You know, she wanted to, but no. he wouldn't do it. It's like The Professional with Natalie Portman. Right. Where she right. played a 12-year-old. Not really that this, this assassin was protecting her. Anyway, I All digress. Right. I've got a clip here for, you know, ask, uh, talk to uh, Mark. To Mark, man. I'm going to look at something here. I've got... Uh, uh, Mark, Mark, did you ever see uh, the original Casino Royale that Woody was in as Dr. No? Oh, yeah. And we watched that last Sunday, and I had never seen it before, and that is a strange movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it was, it is like the, oh, uh, the, the Bond 
that nobody has seen. <laughs> yeah, well, I feel like I drank a bottle of that abstentine stuff or whatever you call it from the Absent. Netherlands. Yeah, that, yeah. I mean, it's like a trip. The visuals of that movie are incredible. I mean, that, and, and that's out of print, right, Al? As far as I know, yes. We're talking the 1967 release, of course, but... You, you, you want Casino Royale? Yes, it's Casino out of print. Yeah, it's out of print. But you, you can find it on eBay. They want a lot of money for it. I, uh, I, eBay, I mean, Amazon has it for like 59 bucks. Well, that's just way too much money. But I found it on eBay, I think, for 26 something like that. Joanna Pettit is in it. Mm -hmm. Ursula Andress is in it. And uh, it was entertaining. A little music, different. But music, entertaining. music by... Uh, Herb Albert, the Tijuana Brass. Right on. Yeah, I like that. I, I missed the beginning of the show, but uh, yeah. the overlooked uh, What's Up, Tiger Lily. What, That's I a mean, good one. Oh, yeah. I mean, it just totally, I mean, it was over, you know, the, the storyline is what? Uh, egg salad recipe? Right, and, right. Uh, <laughs> You know, how does Woody really, come up really, with this really, stuff? How does really, how does he yeah. dream up this stuff? He must have a a great mind, and he does he knows he doesn't do drugs. Not one thing he does like beer. He will drink beer, but he's, that's a drug. But 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 he's not an alcoholic or anything. But you know, he's just got a great mind. He he just he can come up with very like Einstein. Yeah, he was just he's he's over, he's just so smart. He just he really is. Yeah. But uh, no, I, and yeah. you know, I'm glad you're a fan of Woody Allen. I've I wanted to do a show on him for a long time, but uh, I just uh, it was Al's turn to pick the topic, and so I just he's, he's yeah, one of my, I, huh? It can be polarizing for sure. That, that, know, that's just, that's true. I mean, we'll talk, we'll talk about that, but you know, it's, to me, I don't care about somebody's personal life. I don't care what they do outside of what they do for a living. I don't care what actors do outside of what they do on the screen. You know, if I like their acting and I like their movies, fine. It's just like a lot of people don't like Jane Fonda. I've met Jane Fonda many times. She's polarizing. I understand that. And what she did back in the day was wrong. I will agree with that. But And today. But, but, it, but it doesn't affect her acting ability. I yeah. still like to watch her on screen because oh, she doesn't do movies much anymore anyway. But her, her previous movies, I like. It's just like I liked on Golden Pond. I like oh, yeah. Barbarella. Yeah, Barbarella's yeah. a great movie. But, you know, it's just, it's just like, I don't care what Woody Allen did or who, who he married or what he did in the past. Nobody is perfect, but it doesn't affect his movie making. I, I just like his movies, and uh, nothing will change that. I mean, I know it's not Chance's cup of tea. He likes more of the Marvel-type movies, which is fine. I like some of those. No, I like action. I mean, if I'm going to pay to see a movie on the big screen, right. I want it to be big budget. I mean, I, I'm not that simple-minded. It's not that I'm shallow. I'm somewhat shallow. But I'll see those movies at home, the ones where, that are talkies, the ones that really engage your mind, that are lower budget. Well, that's the I'll way watch Woody those Allen at home. Is. I'm not going to pay money. Yeah, I mean, that's just me. Well, Woody, I appreciate them, Woody though. Allen writes great dialogue, and it's just conversation, which is what I like. You know, it's it's not I've no car. Seen, what what's that? What's that, Mark? Uh, Woody, I don't think I've ever seen a Woody Allen movie at the movie theater. I've only really. Seen yeah, no, never have. Well, his movies never. they they did well. They they weren't you know blockbusters like you know Marvel and all that sort of stuff. But they made their money back. Mm -hmm. um, and just like Manhattan. He in home video. Yeah, well, he, he didn't care for Manhattan. I don't know why. It's a great movie. But for some reason, he just didn't care for it. And he told United Artists, he says, look, please don't release this movie. Shelve it. I don't want it released. And I did not know that. But the suits loved it. United Artists said, it's a great movie. Of course we're going to release it. We got a bank loan to make this movie. We got to pay the loan back. And so the movie's going to get released. And Woody Allen, was he didn't, you know. But And it turned out to be one of his biggest hits. Manhattan. How about that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, it's not Woody Allen, but on along the same line of thinking, where uh, the person who made it hated it, but uh, fans loved it. Just briefly, there's a band, King Crimson, the lead guitar player, the head of the band, Robert Fripp. They put out an album. He hated it. He's like, and they would never play any songs off right. of it. And he's like, well. <laughs> I guess we'll start. I guess there's people out there that like it for some reason. I can't figure out why. It's just like I used to. I used to be a dailies operator. I worked on a lot of movies, and so there are some actors 
They did not go to daily. They, not, they they would not watch themselves on a screen. Harrison Ford would watch the dailies. You know, I'm 42. But, anyway, well, you know, but a, he, but you know, a lot of actors would not go to their dailies and watch them. They wouldn't even. Did you know? What about Denzel Washington? Who you worked with? Oh, he did. He but, watched the dailies. Okay, but you know, uh, we all remember Catherine Hepburn, the great actress. She never watched any of her movies. She didn't like she she didn't Kevin like, Bacon's that way supposedly she did, she did not like seeing herself on screen. A lot of actors are like that. Yeah, why is that? You think insecurity, basic insecurity, and they think it'll affect their performance moving forward. Well, Woody Allen didn't and they'll go overanalyze to, themselves. Woody Allen didn't go to his movies after they got released. He didn't care to see them. I mean, but it's anti ego. Yeah, but he he's, he's he is anti ego. He's Woody Allen is non Hollywood. Yeah. You know. Early on, like when he was on Carson and the, a lot of the talk shows, yes. But after he started making movies, he wasn't. That's cool that you can separate the art from the personal stuff. I do have a Facebook comment I want to read while Mark's on the line from Gene Riley. He says about Woody Allen, Weird dude. Makes great movies, but yikes. Marries his adopted kid. Well, we'll get into that. I mean, that's, but you know... I we have, had to address the elephant in the room. Well, I'll, I'll but, talk about but that. But that was 20 years ago. And, you but, know. You, know, I, you know, like I said, you know, I have my feelings on that. But like I said, it doesn't affect me liking his movies. How about you, Mark? No, it doesn't. I, 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 I try not to... And besides, it was it, it wasn't his blood daughter. She was adopted. I understand <laughs> the... Con, you know, but, you know, we'll get into it. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't his actual daughter. So, I mean, in the, uh, but like I said, you know what people do in their private life is fine. I don't really, I don't really care. You know, as long as I like their movies, that's all that matters to me. I'm just a guy that likes movies, you know. And I don't, I don't no judgments from Al Hardy. I don't, I don't care what people do in their private life. I really do not care. As, as long as, long as they, they don't murder someone, as long right? As they don't murder somebody and and worship the devil or drug <laughs> them and rape them, like people we won't mention that are famous that are paying the price right now. Well, you know, that's just you know, that's what the laws for. That's what judges are for, right? Yeah. We're not the judge and jury. No, we're just guys that like movies and mm. TV shows and music, right? right? That's true. That's what the show's about. Well, I, it's funny that Mark says he's never seen a Woody Allen movie in the theater. I couldn't wait till you know the movies came out because I, I would. I used to work in the theater business. I was a projectionist, so I, I always got to see a lot of them for anyway. For free, for free, you know. <laughs> so you didn't pay to see. Any I mean, of I these. worked. I worked. In a, I worked in a lot of theaters in Atlanta. I worked at the Terra, which is on Cheshire Bridge Road. I worked at uh, the Midtown Art I in worked, Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, I worked. At, I was manager at the Plaza downtown. Um, so you around. are a movie aficionado, movie geek, because when we go to movies, you want to see the projector. You ask the manager, "Hey, I used to even, work in a movie theater. Can I see the projector?" Even though it's a digital projector, now I still yeah. like to see them. Yeah, you know. Can I see the movies you have in stock? But Mark, I mean, in you, house, you need to go check him out in the movie theater. He has a movie coming out. Well, let's see. When is the last movie Woody? Did? And I had a list here. I'm trying to see. I was from a small town, though. So yeah. That well, I watched really, a movie I, on. I can't even remember seeing a, you know, a Woody Allen movie playing up until the Purple Rose of Cairo. Well, that know, was a good then, movie too. Oh, it's a great movie. You know, that's uh, that's it's kind of like, and, and you know, because Mia Farrow fell in love with the movie star, and so <laughs> after Frank Sinatra. Well, you know, and I'm talking about the Purple Rose. Of yeah, Cairo. I know. I'm sorry. The character. I got you. Yeah. I got you. I'm sorry. It's, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, you know. And Woody Allen, how he got in the movies, he said when he was a kid, there was a theater in Brooklyn, I believe it was called the Victoria. And he used to go to the movies all the time. And he would actually walk up to the screen and see if it was, you know, he was a young kid, but he would walk up to the screen and, and, and see if it was, you know, real or not. It was just, he was fascinated by movies. And uh, the first movie he recalls seeing was uh, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the Disney movie. When he was a kid, and he watched uh, Bambi. So, that, you know, he watched movies as a kid growing up, and then he became a filmmaker. So. Recent days, he has A Rainy Day in New York that he wrote. Right. And Rifkin's Festival 2020. Yeah. So, and there, you know, like I said, you know, I, I, I'll, go, I'll go to the theaters if the theaters reopen at a normal, you know. Well, we've been going, man, here in Atlanta, Georgia. we got the studio movie grill we go to, and shout out to the theater that Bill Tush runs. Oh, the, the Sandy, Sandy Springs, Springs Cinnamon Tap House. Yes. You always say Tap House and Cinnamon. I, got, I was about to get it right, but you it's, beat me to the punch. It's just Cinema first and Tap House later. You know. Well, Mark, listen, thanks yeah. for calling, buddy. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you like Woody Allen. Oh, yeah, not a problem. I'm glad I finally 
got up early enough. So. Okay. Great to hear from you again. <laughs> hey, is there a movie trailer of the Woody Allen movies you'd like me to play that we may not have played yet? Or not really? Oh, I, I, like I said, I missed the internet. My internet was down. Oh, so okay. Didn't, didn't, didn't even get in until 40. Uh, four, I'll go back and check it out. Okay, but, okay. We, we played one on Love and Death. It's a yeah. great trailer. So I'm about check to play one in a minute, but... Movie. For sleepers, I'm going to play the sleepers trailer in a sec. All right. Well, listen. Right. Thanks for calling, Mark, and uh, thanks for uh, being a, a fan. Okay, buddy. Thanks, okay. Mark. Okay, sure. bye. Yep. Yeah, great guy. Well, we mm -hmm. you know we talked about Manhattan and yeah. how Woody Allen did not care for the movie. He just didn't care for it. Well, Mario Hemingway, who played the, the love interest, she was 17. She actually liked the movie, and she had this to say about it. Take a look. I absolutely loved it. I think that Alex has just created such. A wonderful script from I mean it's totally different from the book and don't go in expecting that it's you know the sun almost rises and it's gonna be exactly because my grandfather wrote between the lines you know what I mean so mm -hmm. he would say something and then there was all this description and Alex really had quite a chore to like figure out what we think that they are thinking or doing so and and she did it so brilliantly I really feel like she captured um, the essence of the story and got to the core of what, you know, what it was about and, 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 and pared down the characters so that you could deal with what, you know, he's in love with this woman that he can't make love to and, you know, and this, the pain of that and, and, you know, and the destruction. I just, and the jazz, I love the music. I just thought it was fantastic. Yeah, Mario Hemingway was, uh, she was really good in it. She's really young. Um, so, uh, but yeah, she, uh, like I said, you know, it's a great movie, one of his biggest hits. I have the trailer for it if you want to hear a little bit of it. And you know who else is in it, don't you? Of yeah. course, you know, because you've seen it so many times. Say it. Who, who's the beautiful actress that's won many Oscars that's in that film? Uh, Meryl Streep. Yeah. All right, here's the trailer if I'm potted up. Yeah. I don't know why I can't hear it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, it's going got great music in it. I hope I don't get dinged for this. I probably will. Oh, God. No, you probably he won't. New York City. He idolized it all out of proportion. Uh, no, make that he, he romanticized it all out of proportion. Better. To him, no matter what the season was, this was still a town that existed in black and white and pulsated to the great tunes of George Gershwin. Uh, now, let me start this over. Chapter one. He was as tough as and romantic as the city he loved. Behind his black-rimmed glasses was the coiled sexual power of a jungle cat. Oh, I love this. New York was his town, and it always would be. Manhattan, starring Woody Allen. Well, okay, well tell me, why did you get a divorce? Why? I got a divorce because my ex-wife left me for another woman. Okay? Really? Mm-hmm. God, that must have been really divorced. I don't know. I thought I took it rather well under the circumstances. Oh, I tried to run them both over with a car. Diane Keaton. Oh, no, no, no. You're much different. You're much different. You're yeah? Yes. You're someone I could uh, I could imagine having children with. Really? Yeah. Well, hit the lights. Go ahead. Turn them out again. Michael Murphy. You don't want to make a commitment, and I don't want to break up my marriage and then find out that we're no good together. The point is, what the hell am I doing in this relationship anyway? My phone never stops ringing. I could go to bed with the entire faculty of MIT if I wanted to. It's just, I don't know, I'm wasting myself on a married man. Mariel Hemingway. See, I'm glad you could get out tonight, you know, because uh, I really did want to see you a lot. I like it when you get an uncontrollable urge. Yeah, I know, it's my best feature. Meryl Streep. Hey, don't write this book. It's a humiliating experience. It's an honest account of our breakup. Jesus, everybody that knows us is going to know everything. Look at you. You're so threatened. Hey, I'm not threatened because I, of the two of us, I was not the immoral, psychotic, promiscuous one. I hope I didn't leave out anything. <laughs> All right, there you go. That's most of the trailer. I'm afraid of copyright. So, but you know, Meryl Streep wasn't in it very much. You know, yeah. in the movie, I did see that. You know, they they divorced, but you know, uh, Meryl Hemingway, now uh, Meryl Streep left Woody Allen for another woman, and so he he goes to see his ex-wife. You know, with his her wife now and their son. You know, and that's the, what the scene was. She says, "Well." You know, how was my son? Does he wear dresses? Does he play football? What does he do? Because <laughs> he yeah. hasn't seen him in a while, you know. Of course, the first movie I remember seeing with Meryl Streep was Kramer vs. Kramer. That was, was a Dustin good movie Hoffman. Too. Yeah. yeah. She's made a lot. Of, she's a great actress. And, Don't and, get me wrong. Kate Jackson was supposed to play 
in that movie play her role. Yeah. But she was contracted to Charlie's Angels anyway, and that's right. why she quit the show allegedly. Well, you know, we all know we talked about Woody Allen and when he was married to Mia Farrow. Of course, they had a nasty split after you know, you know, he fell in love with his adopted daughter. And very so, controversial, right? Well, you know, we, I've got this little okay. little clip, and we'll address it here, and then we'll we'll move on. Okay. This, this is uh, this is uh, from uh, ABC News. For the first time in more than 25 years, Woody Allen's wife, Suni Previn, breaking her silence about their relationship. It's made headlines for years. And tonight, new allegations against her adoptive mother, Mia Farrow. And tonight, many of Farrow's other children are defending their mother. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. The story rocked a family and made tabloid headlines. Director Woody Allen caught in a relationship with the 21-year-old adopted daughter of his longtime partner, Mia Farrow. More than 25 years later, Sunyi Previn is breaking her silence in an explosive interview with New York Magazine, saying Farrow emotionally and physically abused her, including slapping her across the face and spanking her with a hairbrush and calling her stupid and moronic. But Previn adds, I was never interested in writing a mommy dearest, getting even with Mia, none of that. She's also defending her husband of 20 years against allegations he molested Pharaoh's then seven-year-old daughter, Dylan. Allen was never charged and has always denied the allegations. He's lying and he's been lying for so long. Previn telling the magazine what's happened to Woody is so upsetting, so unjust. Mia has taken advantage of the Me Too movement and paraded Dylan as a victim. In the piece, the author acknowledging she's a longtime friend of Woody Allen. Tonight, seven of Pharaoh's nine children are standing with their mother, including son Ronan, whose investigative reporting helped spark the Me Too movement. Ronan Pharaoh calling his mother a devoted mom who created a loving home, adding, but that has never stopped Woody Allen and his allies from planting stories that attack and vilify my mother to deflect from my sister's credible allegation of abuse. And Dylan Farrow, who came out with allegations against Woody Allen, tells ABC News no one is parading her around as a victim. And she slams the magazine for what she calls a one-sided piece. And David, the magazine says this is Previn's chance to tell her story. All right, I understand Mia Farrow's disgust with everything. But like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't affect his movies. And um, I will tell you this, that uh, you know, after that, Mia Farrow won sole custody of their son, Ronan. And uh, Alan had to pay $3 million to Farrow for this. And then Woody Allen said, what was the scandal? You know, Allen told uh, Reuters in an interview, I fell in love with this girl, married her. But people refer to it all the time as a scandal. And I kind of like that in a way, because when I go, I would like to say I had one real juicy scandal in my life. There you have it. So we can move on. So we can move that. on. We can move on. So that's, you know, that's that's just the way it is. But, you know, it's just, uh, it happens, you know. Nobody's perfect. You're not going to judge, that's for sure. No. I'm you just not. want to watch the movies. I just want to watch the movies and that's it. Hey, do you mind if I play a little bit of uh, Back to 1971, Woody Allen, again, guest hosting tonight show with Bob Hope. This Fine. is really cool. Let's or do you I have something you'd rather talk no, about? No, we'll do that right now. All right, let's get this out of the way. More to come. Doc Severinsen and his orchestra. Yeah. How long does this run? Here it is. I don't know, but I'll cut it after a couple minutes. We're back. I um. It's funny. I was just thinking about this. You know, when you when you do the show, they give you notes on the various guests that that come out as to what they're doing, and I'm. I, I find myself writing little notes down here from these notes onto the table because I think. From childhood, you know, I'm an inveterate cheetah at school. Perfect, right? Yeah, and, and I can't just look at their notes. You know, I don't feel comfortable unless I have a jib sheet here with all the uh, yeah. the notes. This next uh, gentleman um, is uh, certainly one of my great idols. I mean, I spent um, my whole childhood seeing his movies over and over and over again. And then you'll notice if you watch Bananas how much I've secretly uh, copied and and have been influenced by him. He's certainly one of the greatest comedians i think has done some of the greatest comedy films we've ever seen uh, i have to mention that he will be at harrisburg virginia tomorrow and at tulane university on may 8th and that's all i can say welcome bob hope
Thanks for the memories. I love Bob Hope. Applause, applause, applause. We should do a show on Bob Hope. Did enough for me? I, it's a, I have to say this before you go on. When I was younger, and I used to go out on dates with girls, beforehand, 15 minutes beforehand, I would always think to myself, tonight I'm Bob Hope. <laughs> and I used to get all the lines and get everything ready and the little funny walk that he does and everything and, you know, and go out on the dates with the girls and the lines would come off just as quickly as could be and, and I went through the whole evening. Don't tell me you scored better than I did. <laughs> um, no, I was going to get to that point. Uh, why are you so dressed up? Man? I'm going to the, uh, i got to go right to dinner here for the Dutch Treat Club at the Ambassador. Oh, what is that? And, uh, well, it's a, you know, it's a, probably one of the oldest clubs in, uh, ever in New York. It's a bunch of newspapermen. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're giving me some kind of, you know, you can, they give you an award to come to dinner and say a few words, you know. And they're giving me the first Rube Goldberg Award. Do you remember him? Oh, sure. Have all the gimmicks. And sure. I think he invented, he invented the Edsel, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, they're giving me, and it's uh, some kind of award they build up. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor, you know, and, I, and they're all friends of mine, a lot of friends of mine. Some of them have reviewed my show. Yeah. But uh, do, you, do you go night to night from being honored here and honored there and honored there because... That seems to be... You no, know, around this time of the year, you appreciate a free meal. <laughs> <laughs> so but, uh, they, they have kind, the same you know, thing you, in you Hollywood. Ah, oh, that's me. I got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. It's known as Friends of Jack it. Benny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that great face. Uh, <laughs> I knew you were a sex symbol as soon as I saw you wearing those horny rim glasses. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about his glasses. Okay. I, um, let me ask you, you think you're me, don't you? Uh, I, it's you been my really, fondest wish. No, he's been on television plugging his pictures, and I started that show. That's right. You're the master I don't of the free plug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of plugs. <laughs> of plugs. And uh, you were on David Frost's show last night, and you were against him with a big rating. You're going to be very big. Oh, sorry about that. Is that true? Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, but uh, you do, and uh, I, I've been watching you carefully. And you don't know this, Woody, but uh, you uh, submitted a script to me when you worked with a fellow called Rich uh, when I was in radio. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you wanted a, a writing job. Yeah, I wanted to write for you more than anything. I got his picture. Are you still interested? <laughs> We could, I may be able to use you, Woody. We could talk about it, you know, because... Uh, I love this guy. This is one of the finest young talents on our uh, show. But you're, you're a great delight. Believe oh, me. thank you. That's a great now. compliment from Bob Hope. There we go. We could stop there, I guess. Yeah. That's a great compliment. Let me uh, switch with you. But, yeah, he... Uh, I'm going to have to watch that. Let me see. I'm going to have to take a look at that. I'll send you the link. It's on YouTube. Just okay. look up uh, The Tonight Show, Woody Allen, 1971 on YouTube. We have what? another Facebook comment. One of my favorite Woody Allen scenes is the spider in Annie Hall, which you've talked what, what about. What happened? He, uh, you know, Annie Hall freaks out. She goes into the bathroom, and there's this huge spider in, in, in the shower. And he comes in. <laughs> Woody's just like, he says, that spider is big as a Buick. <laughs> you know, it's a great line. All deadpan. You know, he, he was so neurotic. He was just like, he didn't know how to kill a spider. You know, it yeah. was just like, he was scared of it too. Right, right. You know, it, it, it's funny. You now, know. what about his glasses? All right. Well, I forget the comedian's name, but there was one of his comedians he liked growing up as a, he's a, young, a younger guy. And he wore these black rim glasses. And uh, Woody says, you know, that looks kind of cool, you know. So he went out. He didn't have to wear glasses. He just went out and got some black rim glasses. And that's how the glasses became part of him. Now, later on, they, he's got prescription glasses now. But in the early days, he just had them just because he thought they looked good. And they do. I mean, those glasses define Woody Allen. It was just a look. It was just a look. He wanted, mm -hmm. he wanted that look. And so I thought it was just like, you know, that's so cool. How 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 that how that comes about? There is a you know Woody Allen likes movies. He likes other people's movies. And one of his favorite movies was directed by Martin Scorsese. It's probably uh, the best gangster movie ever made. What's that, Al? Goodfellas. Did you ever oh, see Goodfellas? Of course, I several got, times. I I it's a it. classic. Yeah, I've got a clip here. Oh, good. Where he talks about it. This, I want to hear it. I've got to find it. 
Uh, let's see here. I'm looking. Uh, but I gotta hear some noise. Here we go. Here we go. Now about Woody Allen. Uh, I do like his movies a lot. I was going to use your standard line. What's that? No, I, I didn't care for him. I didn't him. care for that. <laughs> no, I didn't care for him. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that because I do like his movies. Uh, but now, when I get around okay. to Star Wars and Star Trek, you got to be a good boy and let me do, <laughs> let me do my clips. All right, here's, here's I found it. This is uh, Woody Allen talking about one of his favorite movies, uh, Goodfellas. Goodfellas was a great film. I felt when I sat there in the theater, apart from the fact that, again, it's an example of a superb director um, making you feel him as a director, because, you know, you certainly are aware of the director when you see that film. But um, it's like you're there with those guys for the entire two or two and a half hours, however long the film is. You're there with them. You're sitting in those dives when they're playing cards in the daytime you're with them at, and they're with their wives you're with them when they go and dig up bodies and it's just you get the feeling uh, through the through the i guess the talent of the director how um you know that this is how it really is he makes you feel that this is what it really is and it's it's funny and harrowing and informative and um, beautifully wrought, and I, I just thought it was a great movie, a great American movie. Yeah, my uh, uh, favorite uh, gangster movie is Goodfellas, and Woody's absolutely right. Martin Scorsese, he nailed it on that. And I think probably Goodfellas is uh, Martin Scorsese's best movie. If you don't see Chance, he had to go to the um, little boy's room, <laughs> I think. Uh, I think Sonny's out there. But anyway, uh, I've enjoyed talking about Woody Allen. He's always been one of my uh, uh, favorite directors, and uh, I love his movies. And I'm going to try and talk Chance into watching a Woody Allen movie, but he wants to watch uh, an X-Men movie. You know, he's into that, which we, we might we might do that. So, uh, But uh, we appreciate uh, everybody tuning in. You okay? Yeah, I just had to use the head. That's okay. Just had to take a leak. Yeah, Nothing major, That's no nothing problem. Major. And you're not even, well, you got your tea there. Sweet tea, yeah, it's yeah good. but uh, see, Woody Allen is, is, you know, it's a subject that uh, everybody can relate to. I mean, you know, you're not a huge fan, but, you know, you've, you know. But I respect his work. Oh, yeah. And I'm a big well, film buff and historian, so. Well, you know, it's just like your Marvel movies. I I, I respect their making. They're, they're huge hits. I mean, you know. But so. I've collected the comics, I mean, since I was 11 years old. So yeah. it's great, from my point of view, to see these on the big screen done properly with the invention of CGI techniques. Because I couldn't tell these stories properly when I was a kid. Right. It's really, it's like the kid in me. It's great fun. Right. Well, you know, uh, you've actually, uh, you, I don't, you can't see them, but Chance has actually brought me comics I've got on the wall over here. You didn't, yeah. bring, you didn't bring me one today. I forgot. And I also was going to bring you that article in the, you subscribe to AARP Magazine. And there's a, a terrible ARP. article about poor Stan Lee about his final days. It's a six-part article. Mm -hmm. And uh, the boss, Bruce Springsteen's on the cover of this edition, but uh, it's starting to sell on eBay for decent money. I mean, not decent, not big, life-changing money, but more than the cover price. But... Uh, Really sad about how his handlers were stealing his money. Millions of dollars were stolen from Stan Lee. He was mistreated, abused, worked to death signing autographs when he needed rest. It, after his wife died, just things went downhill for Stan Lee. Anyway, well, not I to hope, be a downer. I hope Woody Allen's around for a long time. He's 85 years old, and he's still making movies. You know, besides having gray hair like I have, he still looks the same. You know, he doesn't. No. You know, it's, it's thin people don't age as you know, I I, just, I don't know. He just still looks really good to be 85 years old. Only good thing about being short is if you look at the numbers and the studies, like short people tend to live longer than oh. tall people. I don't know why. Well, it's just like small dogs live longer than big dogs. I didn't know that. Yes. You know, that that's why you have, why? you know, golden retrievers and uh, German shepherds. They lived maybe nine or ten years old, eight or nine, ten years old. That's Ted it. Cassidy, the original Lurch in the Adams Family, he passed away way back in 1979, as we've talked about in a previous pod well, he was a big of a heart guy. condition. Yeah, because he had that heart, and he was he had to pump that big body. Now, maybe that's it. The blood has to circulate. You know, that's a good... It, I bet it is a heart issue, or yeah. kidneys, or... Yeah. Well, I, uh, I've enjoyed talking about Woody Allen, and he has uh, an outlook on life that a lot of people don't really have the same outlook. He thinks that we're here 
that life is here for 100 years, then it changes. And then, you know, he's, uh, he's Jewish, but he, uh, he, I don't know whether he goes to his synagogue on a regular basis. I, that no, I he said, know. well, he claims to be agnostic. That would mean he's right. not religious at right. all. Depending well, well, we'll uh, close it out. I, I want to play this, you know, before we get out of here and talk about, you know. Or one more thing. I want to play this uh, clip from Woody Allen, and he's, he's talking about his uh, meaning of life. Let's talk about the Macbeth sentence. Uh, it's all fury and sound signifying nothing. Are we all dumb? So wh wh when did you get conscious about this fact? <laughs> you, I got conscious at a very young age, but it becomes increasingly more evident as you get older um, that, uh, you know, you start to think when you're younger how important everything is and how things have to go right and your job, your career, your life and your choices and all that. And then after a while, you start to realize that, um, I'm taking the big picture here, that eventually you die and eventually the sun burns out and the earth is gone. And eventually all the stars and all the planets, the entire universe goes, disappears, and nothing is left at all. Nothing Shakespeare's or Beethoven or, you know, all gone, Michelangelo, gone. And you think to yourself, uh, it is a lot of noise and sound and fury. And uh, where's it going? Not going anyplace. It's going... You know, uh, look, everybody's in the world now, and we're all United States and Afghanistan and Israel and Arabs and this president, the economy, and someone else is saying, I hope my movie is good at Cannes, and my wife is saying, I hope they send my dress back from the cleaners in time when I go to the thing. And then uh, every hundred years, somebody presses a button, and a big toilet flushes and everybody on the earth changes. Everybody. All the Muslims are gone, all the Afghanistans, all the Americans, everybody on the planet's gone. And a new set comes in and they're full of worry and anxious and they're doing everything and then button, they're Boom. all gone. And then the, every hundred years it's like the whole planet gets washed clean of everybody on it, all these people that are making your life miserable, your next door neighbors, your people that are robbing you in the street, and you know, all gone. The president and the, the bank robber, and they all out. So, you know, it just seems like a big, meaningless thing. Uh, now, you can't actually live your life like that because if you do you just sit there and you, you why do anything why get up in the morning and do anything so i think it's the job of the artist to try and figure out why given this terrible fact do you why why do you want to go on living why do you why do you care about anything if this terrible truth is there this meaningless end of everything and you have to try and figure out, knowing that it's true, not giving yourself a fake heaven and hell and nonsense, but knowing the worst. Figure out, even knowing the worst, why it's still worthwhile. Um, that's a tough assignment to, to explain to somebody why it's so terrible and why it's still important to uh, go on. And this is a, a challenge for artists all the time to try and figure it out. Now, there you go. Woody Allen. The meaning of life to him. Anyway. I have a review from the great Leonard Malton I wanted to read. It's really short, uh, for the, like me right. and Woody, but it's about Sleepers. My fa Sleeper, my favorite Woody Allen movie mm -hmm. from 1973. And I need some light. <laughs> this is such small print, but uh, Leonard Malton's review is this. Let's see, Woody turns to slapstick in this 
engagingly silly tale of a man who's frozen in 1973 and awakened 200 years later. Yeah. Typical Alan combination of great jokes and duds with more sight gags than usual and an energetic score by the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Well, he used jazz in a lot of his movies. He was a jazz aficionado. He loved jazz. That's As his... you mentioned in the start of the show. He loves jazz, and so um, he plays the cl- You know, when he learned to play the clarinet, a friend of his played the clarinet. He says, when he was just a child, he says, can you teach me how to play? And so he taught... Woody how to play the clarinet and uh, he you know he's really good now really good so um, but uh, yeah I you know like I said Woody Allen's a big fan and I appreciate it and thanks for uh, uh, joining us today for uh, Woody that's and, right uh, do we have a correction corner or one more thing well a slight correction corner if you have the a slight correction corner yeah correction corner and what was that K We've talked about Top Cat the last couple shows, the and the debate show. was, was it really a Saturday morning TV show or not? And I didn't think it was, because I knew it aired originally in prime time right. on ABC for 30 episodes. And so, and you had asked me in last week's show, what night did it air and what time? And I couldn't find that on the internet, mm-hmm. but in my trusty book that I forgot, ah. which I have today, I can answer that question. And you already corrected one thing I wanted to correct, by the way, about when... Uh, Casino Royale, the original well, was released. It was six, you corrected six, it already. I said 69. Last week really, you meant 67. Really 67. So Top Cat aired September 27th, 61, to September 26th, 62. But here's I'll where I was it. wrong. Take the call. I would take Hello, who is this? Hmm. Hi, this is Bernie Jenkins. Oh, boy, we got a prank caller. This is good. How are you, man? What's up? You said prank caller. I'm just teasing. What's going on? How can we help you today? Do you like Woody Allen movies? Uh, maybe I could pray for y'all this evening. Okay. Well, we could always use prayers, and I'll pray for you as well. All right. Okay. Bow your head. Close your eyes. They're closed. Go ahead. All right. Oh, Lord, I pray that you help these men get through the evening and get off that crack pipe and and alcohol and and, and showers and wipe their eyes, Lord, only you can give them the strength to bless them, Lord, with the soap and hot water they need. Wash your ass like the great Red Fox said. I love it. Thank you for the prayer, my brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That made my day. That was great. <laughs> I, that was a good prayer. Wash your ass. That's, hey, in the days of COVID, that's good, good advice. But Top Cat, to answer your question, it aired Wednesday night mm-hmm. on ABC TV from 8.30 to 9. But get this. Here's the kicker. Reruns of Top Cat aired for several years on Saturday morning. So you and Tom were right. On ABC from October 62. Well, that's where I saw it. Now, to we, March 63. It, you know. and, and on NBC, different network from April 65 to May 69, a long time on Saturday morning. So yeah. I was wrong. Yeah. Top Cat really was technically a network Saturday morning show, even though it was in reruns mm, at that I point. I had one more thing, but I lost track of what oh, I was I know. going to well, say. I know what it is. Do you have the one more thing music? or If you don't have it, that's no, okay. I, I got it here, you know. Go You're ahead. one more thing. You go first. You I, wanted to I, talk no, about gotta, Backstreet Eatery. Well, you talk about that. Go ahead. All right. When you think about what your one more thing was, but... All right, we had the pleasure, thanks to our listener and friend Michael Hopkins, of going last Thursday night to a wonderful restaurant in Duluth, Georgia. It's called Backstreet Eatery. And Chef Giovanni really treated us to some delights. Creme brulee dessert to die for. It was the best creme brulee I've had since Panos and Paul's here in Atlanta, Georgia. And they have some Italian dishes. They've got the best hamburger I've had in quite some time. And, uh, and everything's handmade there. It is. They have everything. potato chips that are handmade. And that soup he gave us was delicious. Yes. It, and he has uh, all sorts of wonderful bisques. And uh, I was going to tell you, the burger that I had is called the Patriot. And it's a charred broiled beef patty with mixed greens, like spring salad on top. Very healthy with a wonderful sauce and hickory bacon. So if you're in the Duluth, Georgia area, please go to the Backstreet Eatery. And then I wanted to shout out to Wizard World. Uh, they've always been a leader for 20 yeah, years. I'll, I'll hold that a little bit closer. In the talk. convention world and with the 
age of COVID-19, you know, fan conventions and meet and greet with celebrities have been curtailed. But what Wizard has done that's really cool is they do virtual conventions with celebrities and they're free. And if you choose to buy autographs or even a private one-on-one session, you can do that. I would go, if I were you, if anything, Saturday and Sunday, check out and Friday night and Wednesday they have rewatch parties. Just go to Wizard World on YouTube and subscribe there and go to Wizard World on Facebook and you will be notified when they have a live event and uh, it's always was they had one on Pirates of the Caribbean Saturday night it was great they've had one on Baywatch it's well, not just I, sci-fi I, fantasy I did check I do have some Pirates of the Caribbean movies good we'll, we'll watch those but I wanted to thank Mike Gregorek he's the program director and one of the hosts over at Wizard World and also the MC uh, Jerry Milani so they had me on Wednesday night to talk about Land of the Lost in a rewatch party and to promote the pod blast and talk Land of the Lost. And there was a guy named Adam dressed as a slea stack. Anyone that's seen I that show, that. it's a lizard. I saw that, yeah. The slea, a slea stack, for those that don't know, a layman in the audience, it's, it's just like a giant, it's like a lizard. It's actually a little lizard, right. a humanoid, like an alien lizard. And, uh, and Adam was dressed up and he had the background. And so anyway, Wizard World, go there and support them. Um, and I hope that they'll be back doing one-on-one conventions in person, face-to-face, but the virtual ones are really, really cool, and they're safe. So that's all I had for my one more thing for the week. Well, I have one more thing. I thought about what I want to talk about. I want to address, uh, we talked about Hollywood and, and Woody Allen, the movies. I want the movie industry to get their act together. I just, you know, it's time to move on. You know, we have to live with what we have to live with. You know, and shutting everything down like movie theaters and stuff is not going to prove anything except put people out of work and theaters out of business. That's what I'm saying. It's going to put, you know, it's time to get back on track. Yes. Take precautions. Wear a mask. I'm I'm a believer of that. I wear a mask when I go out. But we have to move on. And theaters now, you know. Major chains are shutting theaters down. They're not going to reopen them. And it's just really sad. And it's going to hurt production, too, on the production side. And you like Marvel movies. Yeah. And now, you know, they're not going to make any Marvel movies until the theaters get back. No, in. everything will shift to Disney Plus streaming, which kind of sucks. I like to be in the theater with but, a crowd. But, but who wants to watch one of those movies on a TV screen? I don't. All right. Not, not a big action movie. But I agree. Safely, there's a way to do this with social distancing you got to give people the choice. Now, we, we, we go up here to the Studio Movie Grill, and they're very clean. I mean, they, they're they very precautious. All the employees wear a mask. They don't require you to wear one, but we wear one going in because you, you can't you can't wear a mask and drink a Coke and eat popcorn. And so and it's, it's reserved seating, so you can pick where you want to sit. You don't have to sit next to anybody. They won't put you next to anybody. In fact, when we bought tickets, when we went and saw um, what was it, the Liam Neeson movie, Oh, that was part of my one more thing. Yeah, yeah. Honest Thief. Honest Thief. They they, they actually put us a seat apart. If you, if you, if you looked at where they do it, well, of course, we sat next. But, they, you know. So, and we went uh, with Michael Hopkins. Yeah, Michael Hopkins. And so they're, uh, you know, so they're, you know, go to the movies. Support the cinemas because if you don't, they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone, man. They're, they're going to be, be gone. gone. Don't be a, Look, if you can go to the grocery store, if you can go to Walmart, you can go and sit down in a movie theater and watch a movie. And there's so much crazy stuff going on in the news. It's great to just escape. And movies with some well, hot, fresh popcorn. And, and Did you like Honest Thief? I did. Did yes, you like it? Yeah. Tell, tell people the plot, if you don't mind, real quick. Well, the plot the... was Liam Neeson's one of my favorite actors. <laughs> he plays a bank robber. You know, a serial and, bank robber, and he's an ex-marine and an explosive expert. So, Demolitions. Yeah, demolition. So he could go and blow up a vault and be in and out quickly and take a lot of money. And over the the six year period, they called him the in out badman. That's why you know the the media, the police call it the in and out because he was in and he was out. But over a period of time, he stole nine million dollars. But he had all he he didn't spend a penny of the money he stole. He didn't spend any of it. It was just the thrill of robbing the bank. He put it in a storage locker, in he a storage put it, unit. He put it in a storage in unit. In suitcases. And, and so the storage unit, he met this woman who managed the storage unit, and they he become, fell in love. They fell in love and became an item. Well, It flashes he, forward a year later after so, they meet. So he decided to go straight. So he called the police and the FBI and said he was the in-out bandit because none of them believed him. He says, you know, they said, And it's like the Unabomber, a legend, like they never have caught him. Right. They never had a good lead right. to catch this guy. Yeah, and so uh, they didn't believe he was the real 
thief. In and, in and out. In and out. In and out bandit. And so. Uh, and, and he so, hated that term. His character he goes, "Why did you guys call me the?" And then, bandit? and then they finally, the FBI sent two guys over to his uh, hotel room, and he gave them the key to go to the storage unit. He says, "In that storage unit, there's three million dollars." No, he says nine. He said nine, yeah. but he only had he had three, three stashed there. Stashed that they found. there, that one. And so anyway, they they went to the storage unit and they were looking through the boxes and found Ooh. books and stuff like that. And so uh, they went to one box and pulled out the books. And there the money was, $3 million. And that's where the corruption comes and in. And the corruption started because these two FBI guys said, this is our retirement. And so... Actually, it's one. It, it, well, one yeah. rogue FBI well, no, agent the, persuaded uh, the other one to do it. The other one was reluctant. He was re, he's reluctant. But then the whole movie becomes a cat and mouse thing. And so, uh, and it's really, it's highly entertaining. And so I, I recommend the movie. I won't tell you how it ends, but throughout yeah. the rest of the movie, it's him trying to catch them and them trying to catch him. And they're trying to get rid of evidence and murder witnesses right. and the FBI guys. Right. And it, actually the, uh, the, uh, the storage unit, they had video of the guys putting the boxes of money in their back of their car, their yeah. squad car. But anyway, and so... Evidence. And there was a guy who played their boss. You know his name. He's from Marietta, Georgia. Patrick. Mr. Patrick. He, he was he played, best known for Terminator 2. That was yeah. his big break as the killer. And he was in uh, Identity Thief playing the bounty hunter. Right. And from so, Marietta, Georgia. But he was in the movie also, and he plays their boss. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a, it's very entertaining and it's nail biting. And so, but it, if you like a cat and mouse chase and then, and you like Liam Neeson, then it's, it's your cup of tea. And the funny thing about Liam Neeson, he's very anti-gun, but my God, there's so much gunplay in this in all his movies. That's the funny thing. But again, like you said earlier with Woody, you can separate the art from, from the, the, from the personal. I might not like stand. him personally, but yeah. I like his movies. So that's, that's, that's what matters to me. If, they, if I could be entertained by them. And uh, I get my five dollar or six dollars worth, and, and and the studio movie grill has five dollar tickets. I mean, you you can't really afford to pass up a new movie for five bucks. Yeah. That's right, and, and also you know I want to wish everyone happy Thanksgiving. We we may do a show next week, maybe not. Don't know yet. It's it's uh, we got some birthdays coming up. It's Al's birthday later this month in November. So happy birthday, Al! If happy. I don't see you, I'm sure I'll see you personally, but yeah. show wise, happy birthday to you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I hope your mother's watching. She probably is. Why? You're going to bring me some food, right? Oh, on Thanksgiving. That's <laughs> just a good cook. Just, Rob, Robert I'm, Patrick is the actor. Couldn't remember his first name. Anyway, from Mary to George. Mary so that we were just talking a about. Good actor. He was also, uh, he played in the movie I Walk the Line with Joaquin Phoenix, the story of um, uh, Johnny Cash. Mm -hmm. He played uh, Joaquin Phoenix's dad, and he was mean. Oh, he was just, he was mean. Uh, but he's a great actor from Marietta. Yes, he is. All right. Well, we got some good topics coming up, like the Three Stooges. I can't wait to do that show. And, uh, and also one on the television miniseries, the epic television miniseries and TV movie like Shogun, like Roots, that sort of thing. Played a lot of I clips of that. I remember Shogun. That had um, Robert Chamberlain. Richard Chamberlain. Richard Chamberlain. He played Dr. Kildare. <laughs> yes. And, and then you had uh, Ben Casey on against him. I mean, opposite him on another network. Same type of show. But I've got some digress. Ben Casey shows on film. I, I didn't care for that show too much. It was okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't Dr. Kildare. Yeah, was it was good. the kinder. Gen and then I'm going to do one. I haven't discussed this with you yet, but I think a good topic would be the lame spinoff, like the girl from Uncle. There's a whole bunch of them. I won't go down the list. Well, we but can incorporate them with other ones, <laughs> other other spinoffs. Yeah, but I, I wanted to focus. We could do that. All right, we'll we'll talk in our meeting about that. I was thinking of bad spinoffs. There's a whole bunch I have written down, but uh, cool. Well, all right. Thanks for watching and thanks for tuning in. We have to get out of here. Yeah, we do. We're going to go watch some movies in Al's theater, which you call Hardy Vision. Hardy Vision. Have a good rest of your day. Have a great week. Okay, bye. back on hey we're hanging with you just for another minute or so um you know i was kind of reluctant about this topic but it was a great show i think i learned a lot and i love seeing woody on the tonight show uh those clips are awesome of him hosting the tonight show and it's such a shame that all of those stand-up appearances are lost because nbc erased those tapes in the 60s from 62 to 72 don't you that, think that's really a shame i mean there's not just woody there's so many great musical acts 
And uh, is our okay? I'm seeing a delay. Okay, gotcha. Well, it, gotcha. it takes it 30 seconds to switch back. I saw over. our card up. See you next week. That's cool. Well, now we're back up. Yeah, I gotta save this. Uh, and right now, I was going to say, this would have pissed Al off. I was going to say in the, towards the beginning of the show that uh, today we're talking about someone that's very, very polarizing. You either like him or you dislike him. That's right. I'm talking about Woody Allen. I wanted you to think it was a, pres- a past president or a current pre- No. And then also, I was going to say something else that would have ticked you My off. What show number is this? Um, 46. Let me double check that. I think it's 46. What are we going to do for the 50th show? I already have that. Well, we'll discuss it because it's. I, I'm not a dictator. We'll. We'll. I'll run it by you. I have an idea. I don't want to say right now. Yeah. I'm saving the show. Okay. Cool. So, uh, what's another thing? Yeah, about that that call. How about that call? That prayer. That was funny. <laughs> Red Fox did a funny comedy bit called Wash Your Ass, mm-hmm. and that reminded me of that. And he says, I don't remember he says Go that. to bed now. He did it and back in 83. There was a concert he did in well, Vegas, Fox Caesar's was pretty, Palace. He, he was pretty nasty. He was very blue comedian, but very talented. I miss him. Well, what was he? Uh, you got to wash your ass. Ann Esther, she was a stand up comic. LaWanda Page. Lawanda Page. The great LaWanda. And she, she was, was attractive funny. when she was young. You know that? No. Because on, on Sanford's Son, you know, he always played jokes about her being so ugly, and there's mm-hmm. a, a scene in One Sanford's Son where he rips her wig off and she's she looks like buckwheat underneath it's just hilarious well, i love her she was funny she was yeah. funny as heck yeah but, but i'm really I just it was so fun doing that thing with wizard world i see your audio is saving right now yeah and uh and i'm serious this isn't a commercial for them they really do a great job i was really impressed with their pirate to the caribbean mm-hmm. live cast I reunion i watched the one with you but i didn't i didn't watch the other ones well there's topics that you'll be interested in they do they cover everything they cover a lot Wizard World on YouTube and Facebook. God, what was the other thing? There was another... Oh, hell, I'm having a brain toot. There was another line... Oh, well. It, maybe it'll come to me before we sign off right now. Another line I was going to say on the show that I thought would tick you off. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember now. I was going to say, you know, folks, when Al said he wanted to do a show about Woody Allen, I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be more boring than listening to the Masters on radio. Well, golf to me is boring anyway. A lot of people love it, but I just don't care. For but it. listening to it, I don't mind watching it, but listening. Because actually, there are stations that have it on the radio. Just oh, listen to the play by play. Yeah, there is. On the Masters, there is. Uh, the Masters, you can find on the radio, whether it's satellite or terrestrial. No, I, do like, I do like putt putt. CBS Radio. Yeah. I like putt putt. I do too. I always liked it. He ever I'm, played golf? No, uh, I've never played golf. I don't think. I don't remember. I, don't I, I remember in high school we had rec I, I games, play, recreational games, I and play, we played I, golf I played putt-putt. in high school. I yeah, putt putt, but that's it. I loved putt putt. No, it's funny. Chance and I, you know, he came over here today, and um, we got into a little bit of a argument. I was <laughs> just just like, but it was it was it was a constructive argument. He wasn't real keen on Woody Allen, and uh, he wanted to open up with you know. What a creep he was! And all no, no, not stuff. a creep. But, but I, you know, no, 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 no. I was just—I I was going to do. I just want to do that bit I already talked about about how you know today we're going to talk about someone mm-hmm. you either love. Yeah. I wouldn't say the word hate. I think there's a strong word. Someone you love or someone you dislike. That's right. We're yeah. talking about. But we're, everything's Woody cool. Allen. It worked out. Yeah. I mean, we went, we went an hour and thirty-seven minutes. And you—you you kept saying we can't talk ninety minutes about Woody. I said, trust well, me. I mean, once I got, going, I'm a damn motor like, mouth because I like Woody. Allen, you know but, me, man. I got diarrhea of the mouth, and people say you just like to hear yourself talk. And no, I don't. I hate my damn voice. The Wizard World people joked. I, I think they were joking. They said, hey, we're going to have you uh, voice a promo well, for us. I can do that. And I that. said, I, would, I didn't say this because uh, I, I was thinking it. Well, Al should do it because you're the voice of the team. I, I can do that. Yeah. Of the three of us, you're the voice of the team. You're the mm-hmm. good voice and the professional. You only did this for like 30, what, how many years are, have you been in radio? Since I 1981? I when I was uh, 19. Yeah, and at TZA, long time. Yeah, TZA, you ran things. You kind of got pissed at me one time on the show where I said, "This is my producer, Al Hardy, and co-host." You didn't hear me say co-host. You thought I just said producer, and you go, "Now wait a minute, this is on live radio." He goes, "I am not your producer," and I said, "No, I know it's a term because yeah, you are kinda, producer." It, that did anger me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, oh, man. I get over things. I mean, you yeah. know, it's just like you know. Now I, I today we wouldn't be together if we didn't get along. That's right. We've been way. friends a long time. Oh, since we met in the radio biz. Right, right. I was going to say, uh, or ask you, what movie are we going to watch? I brought one I want to see that's only an hour and 40 minutes long, but 
we can do a double feature because you always accuse me of picking all the movies to watch. Well, you know, Chance being a program director, he's, he's a he's a good movie buddy. Don't get me wrong, but you know, he brings these movies over. And says, well, we need to watch this. You know, I just I. Uh, okay, but you know, I like to pick out movies every once in a I while. I typically do pick a Marvel or action movie because you have that big screen down there and it just those explosions and the action and the sound. You have a killer sound system. I, that's true. 4K, but, you know, but you know. Well, what what do you have on tap? Can I pick a, it's got to be a Woody Allen movie, right? Well, we can watch since we talked about him. That's I mean, fun. we can watch both, but you can know. Can I pick the Woody Allen movie or do you have one that you want to no, show me? I'll let you pick it. Okay. And we we talked about about Manhattan if you want to see that. But you know, it's just no. You pick it well, out. I'm gonna all right. And think about Woody Allen movies; they're short. They're only ninety minutes. Good. He See, rarely. It, it, one movie is only eighty five minutes. So let's watch the shortest one. <laughs> no, that's you know. And then and and, and then uh, my movie. Look, you got on the wall some X Men comics. I brought X Men: The Last Stand. It's the last one where they get cured of being mutants. Okay, I'm very shallow today, but I just I really can we watch that if we watch a Woody Allen. It's only an hour and 40 minutes. It's not no two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour thing. Look it up on the internet. I'm, Let me show the comics. I'm yeah, show the comics I'm on the wall. i the camera around. Okay. Oh, don't screw the camera in this no, shot. Okay. Let's see if I can do this. There's an X-Men right there I gave you with the yeah. brood. Yeah. And then Wolverine 1. Then I got some up there. That's cool. Look at that. See? Yeah, look at that. Up there with the... Uh, Here, I'll point to them. Yeah. Can you see that by the clock? Yeah. Can you see that? Yep. Wish we could. Wish we could zoom. No, I can't zoom. Yeah. There, up there with Don Imus. Here's Don Imus. But yeah. <laughs> I got a text. My mom is watching, and she says, "Turkey Day food for Al. It's Excellent. coming, coming right up." Yeah, those are the. There's a picture of me when. In radio a long time ago. I wonder if Wizard World really... Oh, look at you there. Yeah. You once had dark hair. I knew that. I'm just teasing. We all had dark hair at one time. You had hair that looked like Sonny's. Let me turn the camera. Get that camera angle right again. I get it back. I mean, no, I'm not being bossy. I'm saying I hope you can. I know you can. There we go. I, sometimes I come off as bossy. It's just the way I am. I don't mean to be that way. There we go. Okay. There we go. Oh, cool. it came out good. All right, well, uh, I guess we'll sign off. Let's start watching the movies before it gets too late. What time is it? It's 5.30. Jeez. That's that early. Means... It gets dark at by 5.45. It's not dark yet. You know, it's getting dark. Three Stooges. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll do that one day. I don't, know when, I, don't, I don't know when we're going to do it, but anyway. we will. No, Mo. I worked on a Three Stooges movie for like 15 days, the one they shot here in Atlanta. That movie was awful. <laughs> I, that movie just sucked. I'm sorry. Fairly Brothers, you don't like their movies? Yeah. You didn't like Kingpin? Well, you know, I just like the Three Stooges, and I just, yeah, I don't know. I just didn't care. But we should say our names on the show. Al Hardy, That's and me. I'm Chance Bartels, mm -hmm. and I worked on a lot of movies as an extra, and uh, and I did get an agent, and I've done some speaking stuff, some real roles on shows like It's Supernatural, thanks to friends of mine in the Atlanta area. But I worked on a lot of sets, whether it was an extra or whatever, and, and we'll talk another time. Of course, Walking Dead working with a squib, getting shot in the head. That was a hell of a lot of fun. Happy memory. And the Three Stooges movie was fun, but it was hot as hell. We were at a mansion near the governor's mansion here in right. the Atlanta, Georgia area on Paces Ferry. And right. it was outdoors. Uh, it was a party scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh, was it hot. And I had to wear, like, a, a camel hair jacket. Oh, All, right. Anyway. All right. All right. All right. No, right. Enough. We so. got to go. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Next time. Maybe Sunday we'll figure it out. Okay. Or then following Sunday. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Okay, goodbye.